Hello everyone, this is Stuart Meyer with Social Frequency, and today I'm here on behalf of the Michigan Society of Association Executives. I've been given the honor of presenting and facilitating one of the keynote sessions at this year's Org Pro Conference entitled, Your Life is Your Story, Your Story is Your Life, How Will You Share Yours? You know, stories are like sparks in our lives, and we'll be exploring how our personal stories shape, guide, and direct or redirect our lives and our personal journeys in a true, authentic, and meaningful way. We're also looking at how association and association leaders can use the art and science of storytelling to define and strengthen organizational culture, foster identity, belonging, participation, loyalty, and influence. As you might expect, this audio interview and keynote session will center around inspiring stories and storytellers. And today, we are extremely fortunate to have with us one of our amazing storytellers, Bill Milliken. And usually, this is a point where I would provide a brief introduction and backstory. But in truth, Bill's life has gone in so many interesting directions, I thought I'd let the story reveal itself as we dive right into the conversation. Welcome, Bill, and thank you so much for joining us today. Well, I'm glad to be connected, Stuart. Definitely. So when you were growing up, what were your most authentic personal interests? I grew up in northern Michigan, and uh, so it, um, it was a uh, rural and, and resort sort of character to the neighborhood. And uh, snow came every, uh, every November and stayed until April, and at least then, and skiing was a big part of our lives. I used to race, I used to ski competitively, high school ski team, uh, Central United States Ski Association, and uh, skiing was a, a big part of my um, high school level um, regimen until I went away to boarding school in Connecticut, and that sort of put the kibosh on competition skiing. <laughs> was, it, was it a tradition in your family, or is it just something you just gravitated towards? It was a tradition. My mother, who was a Denver girl, uh, was a ski instructor. And so she used to take me in tow on Saturday mornings to the ski hill. That's all we have in Michigan. And uh, turn me loose. And, and so at three or four years old, I was on skis and have been ever since. Awesome. So that, so that sounds like that was your spark that, that fueled these interests at such a young age. And then, of course, the seasonal nature of it all, it was sailing in the summer. The Great Lakes, we were off of Lake Michigan, and uh, I used to race lightning-class sailboats and, and uh, spend an awful lot of time on the water. So that was the other part of the formulative years in Traverse City, Michigan. Always on the move, and I, I think that as we continue the conversation, we'll see that there's a little bit of a trend here. So, But uh, continuing on, growing up, what were some of the things you always wanted to accomplish in life when you think back, those things that naturally came to you? I had a, uh, a real hankering for travel. Um, we used to do uh, long family trips in the car, and... Um, uh, I enjoyed uh, going down to uh, the Carolinas, uh, going back out to Denver to see my grandparents, not to mention skiing in the Rocky Mountains. So travel A little, was, little bit better than it was I, Michigan ski hills, huh? It did, although in Michigan, we have what we call Michigan hard pack on our slopes. That's basically ice. So we were pretty competitive skiers when we got out west because we could ski in any kind of conditions they put in front of us. <laughs> I went to college in Colorado, mm -hmm. uh, but we, uh, uh, I had uh, Denver family, so we traveled to see them every year, and so I always knew Colorado as I was growing up. And what were some of your early influences, uh, you know, as you were sort of shaping your worldview and the things that you'd like to accomplish, uh, you know, you were interested in travel, and, and, and how was that really shaping uh, your direction? I went to work after I graduated from college with uh, an international student exchange program. Youth for Understanding, that was headquartered at the time in Ann Arbor, uh, which is where I now live, uh, before we moved the headquarters to Washington, D.C. And uh, when I joined YFU, I, had, I was a, a volunteer during my senior year at Colorado College in the organization, traveling around Colorado, doing field organization work, talking to principals and language teachers about Americans enrolling to go in overseas study, live study programs. Um, 
but uh, when I when I uh, moved back to Ann Arbor to take that position with the organization uh, Save Canada, I had never been out of the country before, and uh, that was I remember walking into headquarters in Ann Arbor, newly graduated from college, feeling pretty cosmopolitan, pretty worldly. After all, I was a college graduate and I was equipped to go forth and do whatever was necessary. Being thoroughly intimidated by French being spoken in this office, Portuguese being spoken over there, uh, a lot of foreign nationals that were fellow employees, and all of a sudden I realized how small my world was and how much more there was out there that I had yet to get my arms around. But five years of international student exchange uh, work uh, traveled me widely in Europe, Africa, South America, and the Far East. I got a great dose of that travel that I'd aspired to for years. Uh, you have degrees in political science, so uh, what inspired that choice uh, to, to, to study political science? Well, I, I grew up in a political family, and um, when I was uh, at Colorado College, my father was running for governor in Michigan, and under the auspices of the political science department at Colorado College, I took a semester off and worked in his campaign and then wrote a 25-page paper on the uh, organization and administration of a, a gubernatorial campaign in Michigan. So that's one of the things that helped to set the stage. Um, I, uh, I was a political science major at Colorado College, but uh, my real aspiration at the time was to go on and uh, get a graduate degree in urban planning, landscape architecture, something in that area. I never did uh, that never did materialize because uh, Youth for Understanding came along and intercepted that, and all of a sudden I became a uh, a student of international things. Illinois Governor Thompson hired me to come be his assistant campaign manager for one of his reelection campaigns. So I left Youth for Understanding, moved from Washington to Springfield, Illinois, and spent uh, a year on the the hustings in Illinois. Uh, going through uh, trying to do organization for Governor Thompson. And uh, after he was successfully reelected, there was an opportunity to take a role in state government, but uh, I cast about a little bit and decided that uh, instead I would go west in the spirit of Horace Greeley. And I went, went to Denver and I got a job in the oil and gas industry. And I went to work for an oil and gas company in Denver for four or five years until the bad times hit us. In, in 1983, uh, the price of a barrel of oil plummeted. A lot of oil companies, like the small private company I worked for, were over leveraged. They filed for bankruptcy protection. Uh, we laid a lot of people off. I got laid off. I turned in my, my uh, fancy European company car, and, and uh, life uh, all of a sudden changed dramatically. And, uh, and I had a a call from a friend in Washington, D.C., who was working at the U.S. Department of Justice, who asked me if I could come back and do a, some project work for him. And uh, the timing was perfect because there was no employment in Colorado. So I climbed on the plane, flew to Washington, and I ended up spending three years working for the U.S. Department of Justice in Washington, which was fascinating experience. I'll bet it was. What were some of the projects you got to work on? Well, I was working in the public affairs office initially for uh, a couple of years, and then um, I, I was asked by the deputy attorney general, which is the number two official at the Department of Justice, to come to work for her. She was newly appointed. She needed staff. I had done some travel with her around the country, and so uh, Deputy Attorney General Carol Dinkins asked me to come work with her as a spokesman and, and special assistant. So I had a year of uh, travel all around the country at a, in some uh, very unique uh, exposure to undercover activity in New York City, money laundering in Florida, uh, immigration, um, smuggling in, uh, in California, in San Diego. Just uh, fascinating. I didn't even watch television those days. <laughs> I had so much fun during the day that TV had nothing else to bring me. Any any stories in particular that stand out from those days? Yeah, we were we were in San Diego speaking to a U.S. Attorneys Conference, INS, as it was called before we came to know it as ICE, invited 
me and the deputy attorney general to go fly the border at night in helicopters to um, intercept uh, aliens smuggling into the country. I was in one helicopter, she was in another, and uh, we were each controlling the spotlights that shone on the ground. We came across, there were some, some routine patterns, and, and we came across uh, parties that were uh, preparing to cross the border, had crossed the border, were in the country, that were reported to people on the ground where they were then intercepted. At first, it was exciting, but the realization that there were people down there working to uh, get a better life, they had families, and they were coming across the border for a lot of the, the right reasons to try and lift themselves up and get better employment. And I felt badly all of a sudden that we were I was responsible for intercepting some of those dreams. And after we landed, uh, they took us uh, by vehicle to the uh, interrogation stations. And I got a chance to see the faces of many of the people that we'd been responsible for intercepting that night. and. Uh, the, the people that were Mexican nationals who were simply put on a bus and returned to Mexico, uh, people that were other than Mexicans were interrogated further. Um, there was a whole process for it, and it was pretty sobering to, to be face-to-face -face with it like that. Sounds like it really changed your uh, perspective. It was powerful. Now, one of the things that I had read that also in your bio is NASA. What, what, what's the story behind that? That was a bookend to uh, the Justice Department. The uh, fellow that I'd worked for at the Justice Department was hired at NASA as the Associate Administrator of External Affairs, and he got over there and he called me and he said, boy, we are having fun over here. You ought to come over here. I've got a place for you if you want to come. At that point, uh, the administration uh, in the department was changing, and it was a perfect opportunity for me to step across the mall, and I went to work for NASA. I went to Kennedy Space Center. I saw a shuttle launch. That was at a point in our space exploration where at least the agency was getting concerned that shuttle launches were being taken for granted and we were no longer on the front page. Sometimes we didn't make the six o'clock news. And so we came up with the teacher in space idea as a way of involving more people and younger people. And as many of your listeners will remember, um, Krista McAuliffe was the teacher from New Hampshire that uh, was selected as the teacher to go into space on the ill-fated Challenger. And uh, unfortunately, I was only about six months into it, NASA at the time when the Challenger exploded, mm -hmm. and the agency itself went uh, topsy-turvy. The Rogers Commission that investigated the Challenger accident of uh, a number of findings scientifically on what happened to the to cause the shuttle to explode, but. Other recommendations were that uh, people in leadership in the agency needed to have flight experience, military flight experience, and more seniority. And uh, the uh, the path for a guy like me at NASA was suddenly shortened dramatically. And I had a call from Denver, Colorado, from Andy Love, who was launching a campaign for governor of Colorado. His father had been governor of Colorado, and he asked me to come home and run his campaign. And again, the timing, looked at the calendar and looked around me and assessed it. And I said, yep, it's the thing to do. So after three years, I left Washington and went back out west. And I was surprised at how difficult it was to leave Washington. I had been there, as I said, for three years. And when I traveled around the country and I saw old friends, they'd say, boy, how's Washington? It must be exciting to work out there. And I said, yeah, it is, but you know, you've got all these people that have been there for a long time and they take all this stuff seriously and they forget how people live in Des Moines and, and Dallas and Pensacola. And um, all of a sudden there I was three years later in my car, loaded to the gills, headed west with tears in my eyes because I was leaving Washington, D.C. that I too had come to know and to love and had friends in and felt a part of the community. And had it not been for the Challenger accident, I might still be in Washington. Hmm. Wow. But that was one of one of those crossroads that you come to, and off you go, and and uh, you make the best of it, and, and it, it uh, put me on a good path. I did just fine. So you headed out west. What came next? After we lost our gubernatorial election, the George Herbert Walker Bush people called me and asked me if I would come back to Michigan. George Bush, 41, was pitted against the TV evangelist Pat Robertson, who was 
actually running quite a viable campaign in Michigan for the presidential nomination for the Republican Party. So the, the Bush people asked me to come back to Michigan, and I, I came back, and I lived in a hotel in Lansing, and I did field organizing for about five months for George Bush and uh, tried to get uh, county caucuses around the state to, uh, to favor George Bush and got him into as many markets as we could, and we were successful. He did win the Michigan primary. Had he not won the primary, there was some question of whether or not George Bush was a viable presidential candidate, but at least Michigan was not the roadblock. That reintroduced me to Michigan, people that I knew and, and relationships that I had that I uh, reopened, and uh, I took a little inventory assessment of some of the job experience that I'd had, some of the exposure, and, uh, and I thought that um, given my oil and gas uh, experience and fundraising, I'd done a lot of writing. I used, to be a, I used to be a radio and television news reporter at one point, so the written word I appreciated, and uh, I didn't have the finance piece, but I thought that maybe real estate was a, a place where I could land, so I set out on a campaign of my own in Michigan in my car traveling around to meet uh, real estate developers, bankers, brokers, real estate attorneys, find out where there might be a role for me. And uh, after a couple of months, I've, I uh, was uh, employed in Ann Arbor by a large real estate development company that agreed to take me in and teach me the basics of real estate and uh, let me let me do some writing and apply my other talents for them. So that was uh, that was my introduction to real estate. And then in, uh, after five years or so, I, I ran the flag up the pole and started Millican Realty Company in 1996. The way it's unfolded has been pretty exciting. It's been pretty diverse and it's led some great experiences along the way. That's tremendous. And, you know, in the process of, of, of building a Millican Realty, Realty, Realty Company, one of the other things uh, as part of your story was uh, being on board with Art Train USA. Tell us a little bit about that. Art Train USA um, was a museum on wheels, uh, rail car wheels, as a matter of fact. And uh, it uh, Art Train um, was a six-car consist that uh, was started in about, probably in about 1970. And it traveled all around the United States. We didn't have an engine the nation's railroads moved our cars pro bono, and we had a staff that worked carefully with uh, all the Union Pacific and uh, Norfolk Southern and all the, the major carriers to move us from one community to another. And we had a staff that uh, went into some of these communities. The, the target community for our train was probably small towns of less than 10,000 population that probably didn't have a museum and may not have had many uh, arts and crafts programs. And the idea was to a year or two ahead of time to get into a small community of, uh, I'm trying to think, I think, I think our train uh, visited about 40 states mm -hmm. around the country, including Alaska, by the way. And uh, to get into those communities, work with uh, local leaders, educators, artists and set up a program that Art Train would come into, generally spend a week in town, and all the local artists would come out and practice their crafts around the train. Uh, schools from, well, and I remember one stop we did in Minnesota, we flew up to see it. Um, school children came from as far as 75 miles away in wow. rural Minnesota to visit Art Train. And so it introduced a lot of young people to uh, the arts and crafts and uh, we had various exhibits on board. We did. We had a NASA exhibit on board one year, as a matter of fact, of art that was all related to space and the space effort. NASA has quite a collection of art, and uh, the connection was made. I wasn't a part of that connection, but the connection was made with the agency to, to for a year to to put that art on board. And and so we had major collections from major museums around the country that uh, would be uh, curated, placed on board, and and go into small towns to show people what some of those uh, pieces looked like. That's so cool because when you think about the uh, the advent of the railroad, you know, it was it was progress on rails and uh, you know, the work you all were doing there is, is you know, bringing cultural progress uh, to to small small town rural areas. That's really cool. We were up in I told you we were in Minnesota. I'll give you a quick sidebar on that. Um, they uh, they uh, they had a post office in this small Minnesota town, 
And uh, so they had a commemorative stamp for our train. We all had to go over to the post office, and the, the post mistress uh, gave us all stamps, commemorative stamps for our train being there. They had uh, rolled all the fire engines out of the firehouse where they, they had a lunch set up on checkered tablecloths. And so we went from the post office to work our way down a couple of blocks to the fire station. And, and as we did so, this is about 11.30 in the morning, this great big uh, uh, burly guy stepped out of the bar and uh, started walking down the stairs. He had coveralls on, and, and uh, he was a jovial fellow. And, uh, but he looked at me, and I was wearing my suit, and he said, uh, he said, I'll bet you're here for that train, aren't you? And I said, yes, sir, we are. And he said, yep, he said, me and the missus will be back this afternoon. And he crossed the street, and he climbed on his John Deere tractor and drove out of town. <laughs> <laughs> Did you see that John Trude tractor later on when he and his wife returned? I think he came back in a pickup. No, I didn't, <laughs> actually, I didn't see him again. But whereas I was first worried that I might have a, uh, a fellow with a few beers under his belt to deal with, <laughs> he turned out to be a perfectly jovial fellow, and he was coming back to see our art exhibit. So well, I was su- pleased. Such a visual story and, uh, you know, such a great example on... on uh, you know, the ways in which, uh, you know, we connect our country together from small town to large town and at all points in between along those rails. I, I think it's just such a cool program that you were part of. Uh, but let's jump back into real estate. So obviously, uh, it looks like about 22 years uh, you've been involved in real estate. Talk about talk about your interest and passion and, and, and what real estate means to you and the work that you've done uh, um, through your life's career. My real estate market, I'm based in Ann Arbor. And my real estate market is Southeast Michigan. It's commercial. I don't. I don't do any. All I know about houses is I live in one. <laughs> um, so it's it's uh, it's office, retail, industrial, uh, big tracts of land. Those are the kinds of things that I work with. One of the reasons that I like the commercial work is it is absent the emotion that's often involved in residential real estate. In commercial real estate, we are generally working with uh, either a buyer or the buyer's attorney, or accountant, or corporate staff on selecting a location or disposing of an asset. So there's a lot of sophistication in commercial real estate that um, um, I hold a CCIM designation, which stands for Certified Commercial Investment Member. It involves a lot of classroom work, uh, an extensive exam, and uh, there are about uh, 10,000 CCIM designees around the country. Um, so it's, uh, we like to think of it as the PhD of real estate. Absolutely. But that CCIM network has been very useful to me. I'm, on the, I'm, I'm a member of the board of directors of the CCIM Institute. So, and I, I just came back from Tampa, Florida a few weeks ago where we had our board meeting there. And that network of people, men and women, um, is uh, invaluable uh, because you've always got a resource somewhere in that CCIM family to, to turn to if you have a question, you're trying to structure a deal, you've hit a roadblock, you can't get two parties together. There's always a way to, to uh, reach out and, and get somebody else's perspective on it. But <clears throat> I've, been, uh, I've been based uh, uh, in Ann Arbor. Um, I've got a great office building that was built in 1873 that I'm sitting in talking to you right now. It used wow. to be a German farmhouse, two-story Gothic uh, f- uh, architecture perched up on a hill. So we've got a, we got a great little base to work from and uh, a, good, uh, a good local identity. I've, I've been a member of uh, a bank board, uh, chair of the Chamber of Commerce, uh, involved in a lot of civic organizations. So my uh, I've established myself uh, respectably in the community, and, and uh, it's been a good livelihood. Absolutely, and and all of our association professionals listen will appreciate the the credential you just discussed, and uh, obviously your your road uh, on on service uh, and leadership has led its way into the National Association of Realtors. But talk a little bit about what it's meant to you personally to serve in these capacities, uh, you know, in in terms of your involvement within the community, uh, locally and and beyond. Well, um, one of the things that the National Association of Realtors, and I also am a member of the Board of Directors of the, of the National Association of Realtors, in addition to CCIM, NAR, as we call it, 
uh, has a Habitat for Humanity build every year at our fall convention. So I go um, a day early so that I can spend a day in work boots and blue jeans uh, building homes in some cities around the country. When we were in New Orleans a number of years ago, uh, the Habitat build was done in the old 7th Ward, I think, which was the one that was uh, severely devastated by the, the Katrina floods. And uh, we had a chance to, there were four homes that were under construction, and there were about 125 of us that were working on site. And the home that I was assigned to uh, was actually uh, near completion, and our job was to complete it that day in time for a 2 o'clock ribbon cutting with the mayor of New Orleans. So I got a chance to see a woman and her two children who uh, were the buyers of the house who had also, according to the requirements, put in some labor and, and uh, spent some time on site helping to build it. I got to see her on the front porch accepting the key from the mayor with tears in her eyes and her chest just racked with sobs over the, the idea that uh, she and her two children would have a home. And it sounds simple, but it was very emotional, very moving to be standing there watching that unfold. So that's that's one of the places where gratification comes back. I'm a member of the board of, uh, of New Detroit. New Detroit is a uh, Detroit 501c3 nonprofit that was uh, first formed right after the Detroit riots in 1967. Um, when uh, Governor George Romney wanted a, a, a panel convened to determine what went wrong in Detroit, what needed to be fixed, what needed to be changed. But New Detroit survives today, um, and it's a coalition of, uh, of area leaders uh, working for racial understanding and racial equity in Detroit. Detroit is 83% African American, and uh, it's a, there are parts of Detroit that are just thriving today. It's exciting to see Detroit, its population is stabilized, uh, Quicken Loans, the Village family, Little Caesars, uh, making big um, billion dollar investments in the city right now. But Detroit's 139 square miles, and there are still parts of Detroit that are reeling in poverty. 35% of the children in Detroit live in poverty. The Detroit public schools are not healthy. So Detroit still has a lot of need for people to, to care for it. And um, in, in real estate, I'm, some of my peers in uh, southeast Michigan, Detroit, uh, eastern markets, um, sometimes tell me that as an Ann Arbor resident, I live inside the moat. And um, I just love getting into Detroit to get outside the moat, to uh, go do some good in the city, and um, work on a lot of neighborhood projects. And uh, it's uh, that's that's gratifying to see it coming along. Absolutely, and and you know, wh what are the types of things that that are differentiating sort of successful communities in and around the Detroit area from from those that are struggling? Is is it the uh, the corporate investment? Is it education? Wh what's moving the needle for those successful communities? Well, uh, the the biggest needle mover was the Detroit bankruptcy, and. Um, Detroit had been under emergency management with a, uh, by the state of Michigan by statute for 18 years. And under, uh, under state of Michigan tutelage, Detroit had racked up enormous amounts of debt. And um, the bankruptcy allowed Detroit to throw off, they, they renegotiated with bondholders and, and other, other debtors uh, for cents on the dollar to get out from under it. And, Detroit has since, as a city, been able to buy new police cars, buy new buses, replace street lights. You could drive through uh, miles of Detroit at night with no street lights at all. But uh, the infrastructure has been dramatically improved in the last five years. Um, Mayor Duggan was reelected. Um, uh, he was uh, he was a guy. He was uh, the CEO of Detroit Medical Center. He's an attorney by training. And uh, he was uh, uh, challenged, and I think he had a three or four way race when he first ran um, uh, four years ago. But he was just reelected. He's, he's, by all accounts, doing a great job in running the city. And uh, it's, uh, there's a spirit in the city that it hasn't known for 30 years. Detroit used to be a city of two million people down to about 700,000 right now. Mm -hmm. uh, and 
at 83 percent African American, and uh, within that community, there are there are a lot of challenges. Not to, not the least of which is the Detroit school system. There are a lot of kids that aren't getting a fair shake and aren't able to get their foot in the door because they aren't schooled well. But we're trying to change that. Well, that's a great, credible story. Uh, you know, Bill, when you reflect upon your life at this point, as well as the road ahead, all of the things that you've done, what is the story you hope your life is telling to others? Well, you ever hear that expression of... If you're waiting for someone to give you flowers, you can just plant your own garden. <laughs> I have um, now. <laughs> and uh, it just, um, you just got to get out there and, and look at things that are uh, worthy, worthwhile. Um, there's another, uh, there's a Winston Churchill quote that I like. Um, we make a living by what we get. We make a life by what we give. And giving back. I've grown up in a family of public service, and I guess giving back is, is a way of life for us, and it's pretty darn rewarding. You get to meet a lot of people, and, and uh, I, um, three years ago, I, I went to the Detroit Regional Chamber of Commerce um, Leadership Detroit program. I enrolled in that for a year, and uh, it was about 10 months of, of uh, monthly or, or uh, semi-monthly meetings. And uh, I've been active in a lot of civic organizations, had a lot of leadership roles, and usually I walk into the room and I know somebody, and I walked into my first Leadership Detroit meeting, 70 of us, and I looked around, and I looked again. And I kept looking, I'm gonna know somebody here, but I didn't know anybody in the room. And I went, well, here we go, 69 new friends. This is gonna be great. And. Uh, True enough, after, after 10 months, we, we really bonded with one another. And these are people from all walks of life and all ethnic backgrounds. Uh, some were not native English speakers. And uh, it was just a, a tremendous racial, cultural, socioeconomic mix of people that were selected because they were sharp, they were talented in their own uh, lanes, they were high achievers, and we all got a chance to mix it up and get to know each other. And uh, so that's, that's where a lot of my appreciation for the city of Detroit came from, was having that total immersion in it. That's uh, it's so inspiring and, you know, deepening our, our understanding and appreciation for each other. You know, that's one of the things when I look out and, you know, we, we have comparable backgrounds, as we were talking about earlier, uh, working in politics. Uh, you know, the problem, yeah, I think one of the challenges today uh, in Detroit or anywhere else in the country is we just don't talk to each other anymore and we don't seek to understand each other. But when we do, powerful things happen. Communication's key. Absolutely. you got to get in there and open your mind and listen. Absolutely, absolutely. Well, just one one last minute, and I would be remiss if I did, did not bring it up before we leave off, but uh, I, I did look on your Facebook page and saw a photo of you in a 1927 Chrysler Le Mans race car, and uh, I also understand you're a licensed private pilot. Uh, t talk about your passion for race cars and planes. Oh, now, now we get to the fun stuff. <laughs> uh, I couldn't leave it out. When I was, when I was uh, in junior high school, uh, my father and I took a, an Evelyn Wood reading dynamics class in Mount Pleasant, Michigan at Central Michigan University, about a two hour drive from our home in Traverse City. And we were on the way back one afternoon after our class. These are all two lane roads connecting Grand Rapids and Traverse City. And we were passed by a Jaguar XK150, which is a 50s era two seat Jaguar sports car that it just had such resonance from its exhaust. It just imprinted on me just the magic of how much fun that car was. And that's the first that I can put my finger on when I became interested in cars. And we had a neighbor growing up who had an Austin Healey that he raced on the weekends. And I marveled that anybody that I knew actually understood how an internal combustion engine worked. So I used to go over there and look over his shoulder all the time and learn a little bit more about cars. And so my passion for cars really stems from my high school aged years. I bought my first car. Dad and I split the cost of a $600 Jaguar XK120 um, when I graduated from high school. And uh, I drove that car for several years and I've always had a fun 
car since then. And the 1927 Chrysler race car uh, was initially a project by a friend of mine who set out to enter it into the Around the World in 80 Days Millennium Tour that the Royal Auto Club was doing in the year 2000. And uh, he and Chrysler had a handshake on their sponsoring the car, and they got partway down the road, and for some reason that deal fell apart, and uh, this automotive journalist went out and acquired another car, sidelined the Chrysler, and a friend of ours bought it, didn't finish it. I finally bought it from that fella, and uh, I finished it a couple of years ago. And I just got back in March. It was invited to show at the Amelia Island Concord Elegance in Florida in March. And I shipped the car down there, and, and it was one of 300 invited cars on the field. It got rave reviews, and I was a very proud dad. Wow. So so was it just for <laughs> show, or did you, did everyone get to see you driving around? Well, it uh, I, I drove it from the, the, uh, the truck pool a mile away onto the golf course and, and back, but it didn't. We didn't have any more operating time in it down there. I've driven it into Detroit and back. I will drive it up to Traverse City this summer. That's a 240-mile trip. So I plan to, to have some campaigns with it before I'm done. That's incredible. I'm, 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 I bet you don't make it very far before uh, you get uh, gawkers and, and people asking questions and uh, looking at it with fascination. Well, you never pull up alongside another one of those at the traffic light, I can tell you that. <laughs> Something you don't see every day. <laughs> Well, that's incredible. Well, Bill, you know, you've had just such a fascinating life. I'm so grateful for you uh, sharing your story with us. I can't wait to sit on the stage with you and, and talk about your story at Org Pro coming up. Thank you for everything that you do, teaching us the, how important it is to give back. And uh, look forward to seeing all the great things you're going to continue to accomplish in this lifetime. Well, I'll, I'll get on stage with you and be just as lucid as I can, Stuart. Thank you. Thank you so much, Bill. Bill.